Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to each of you. Let's all stand. Ladies and gentlemen, poor, poor, and fifty-seven. To God be the glory.
personally, privately, corporately, take our petitions, our concerns, before the throne of grace, as we call upon the one truly who is able. The Bible says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and help in time of need. Oh yes, his name is wonderful. Brother Sam Navaris, would you lead us in prayer, dear brother? Our Father, we do thank you that your name is wonderful. Amen. Amen. Yes. Father, just open our hearts and our minds to each and every word. Father, mm -hmm. we just ask that you just help us to put the cares of this world to this past yes. week inside of the world that we will focus on you and on your word and on meditating on it. Father, we just yes. ask that you just be with those that weren't able to be here, Father, for reasons of sickness right. and other things, Father, that you just touch their bodies, raise them up. Amen. Page 506, please. 506, Blessed Assurance. 506.
of all things to think that you could win a case for a church in California. Amen. John MacArthur won. One of the one of the restrictions. I mean, California was so restricted that if you did have a church service, you could not have singing. You weren't allowed to sing in church. I mean, to not be able to sing in church is not church. I mean, again, he won, and uh, in, in district court, and so what? I'm sure we're not going to hear the end of that in the state of California because now. Uh, he, he challenged them and won, and they're not going to be satisfied. And they're going to continue, I'm sure, to come after him. And churches like his and like ours, eventually they want to come after us and thus and this. And uh, I've already drew my line in the sand, and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to continue on, and we're going to have live services. And uh, they can take me to jail if they want to, and I'll have a jail ministry. <laughs> you know, it didn't want to throw me out of jail because they don't want me there because I'm too noisy and loud and making too much disturbance. So, Amen. You know, that's what's, that, what's happening. They can change the doors, lock on this church, and that's fine. We'll just uh, we'll just leave out the parking lot. You know, it's not Amen. the building this church, it's the people. We'll come to <laughs> So, anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled to death. Uh, about that particular case. Yesterday, we had a food bank, of course, and uh, again, just a tremendous, tremendous day. Uh, we had 90 uh, clients, boxes that we gave out yesterday, and one new family that came through yesterday. And again, a tremendous group of volunteers. We could not do this without our coordinators and our volunteers, and they do such a tremendous, tremendous job. And uh, we are contemplating even enlarging our food bank area, and we are contemplating applying for a grant from Feed America that will help us expand out there with our freezer and cooling space and so forth. So that's just something that's kind of in the mill, we don't know where, what, and so forth, but uh, we are we are uh, pondering that and we're seeing what direction that might go. Uh, we just don't know. But again, what a, what a great day uh, we had yesterday. Brother Rick? Well, I think that every time I see pictures of the food bank, they're always sitting on a stool <laughs> because that's my place. <laughs> I get to sit on the stool and drink coffee and talk to everybody. <laughs> and uh, when you're old as I am, you have to sit down and talk to people. <laughs> that's, uh, that's why I get to. Matter of fact, this. I took that cup of coffee down. I was drinking it. I took that cup of coffee down. And Linda Holler said, No, preacher, I want you to hold your cup of coffee. <laughs> so, 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 just, just in all honesty on that. But again, we had a great day and uh, so forth. Again, our online giving is available for anyone that wants to use that particular service. And, and uh, our, our, our giving during this pandemic has been tremendous, tremendous. I don't have the total numbers, but I think that our giving for this period, from, the, from January 1 through the end of July, is above what it was one year ago. Amen. Amen. So, again, our, our people are so gracious and so good and, and love the Lord, and their giving shows that. Our mission giving is up. Our food bank is all of us. All of our, all of us is giving. You see, tomorrow the ladies will have their kind of monthly luncheon at the Sandstone Ranch Complex. Bring your side lunch, and uh, they'll enjoy a time of fellowship. And that starts at 11:30 uh, out at the Sandstone Ranch. I want to have the officers meeting. Our church officers and wives meeting. On Thursday, August the 27th, we have a net this year as such, uh, and I just want to 
until after we haven't done that anyway, we're going to have a meeting on August the 27th. We'll have something to eat. I'm not sure just what, but we'll have something to eat for men and their wives, and we'll start that at 5.30. I'm also thrilled to death that we also are having a weekly AA meeting here at the church at 9 a.m. each Wednesday morning. And that has turned out to be a tremendous, tremendous blessing to me personally. I think it's a blessing to the church. But most of all, it's a blessing to those who have a place together to meet. And uh, again, several expressed to me uh, Wednesday morning, thank you for letting us have a, have a meeting here. Well, again, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a hospital for all of us. And I'm thankful that we can open the doors to any and every one. And so if you know anyone that would like to be part of a weekly AA meeting that is run by some dear godly people, I invite you to invite them 9 o'clock right here. Operation Christmas Child is coming up. And uh, again, that collection will be November the 16th to the 23rd. Jan Cavender will be again in charge of that and doing that, so we'll do that. Our missionaries of the month are the Scherzers down in Belize. And uh, again, they've been on lockdown, but now they're kind of opening up a little bit. And they have a brand new baby also. Uh, very new this morning, right there on the picture. All right, I believe that's all of our announcements. Is that correct? Brother Terry, let's have one more song. Department 45, please, 445, tell me the story. <laughs> with us, and, and this Luda, 
is, is with us this morning. And I've asked them to come sing for us, for Brother Alex and for Brother Serge to come sing. So you all come at this time and sing for us today.
Street in Michigan. There's so much around here that nobody ever knows about, except me and Jewel. <laughs> uh, and uh, got our internet back up and going, doing it strong again. Amen. And we do Facebook Live. Thank you, Brother Tyler, for the church. It's so good to see Sean and our family with us this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. I want to continue our series on going the second mile with one another. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 41 says, when someone compels you to go a mile, we should go the second mile. God wants us to be second mile believers. God wants us to be second mile followers of Him. And as we go that second mile, we especially need to go that second mile with one another. We've talked about how we are to serve one another. We've talked about how we are one body with one another. We've talked about how we are to love one another. We've talked about uh, how we're not to judge one another. We've talked about how we are to be accepting of one another. This morning, I want to speak about going the second mile as we help carry each other's burdens. We go that second mile and help carry each other's verse. Let's stand together. I want you to follow as I read the first five verses from Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Follow in your Bible as I read these first five verses from Galatians 6. I'm reading from the New King James. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one to the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Father, thank you for bringing us together again on this day that we celebrate you. And I pray this morning that again our hearts would be filled with a compassion for one another. And that we might see the importance, the necessity. There are times that we need to go the second mile and bear with one another the burdens that people may be going through in their lives. Bless this time together that we'll be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you. Be seated. Now, everybody has burdens. Not everyone has wealth, but everyone has burdens. Not everyone has health, but everyone has burdens. Not everyone has talent. But everyone has burdens. And at this moment, you may be carrying a family burden. You may be carrying a financial burden. You may be carrying a physical burden. You may be struggling under some vocational burden or even some emotional burden. But the, the fact is, we all have burdens. Now understand that emotional, physical, and relational burdens are part of life. There are some people who are so low, they can play racquetball on the curb. 
Some of you will get that later. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and without question, we find out that every path in life always seems to have a few puddles in it. And if you're not carrying some burden today, then you're free to leave and go have lunch early. The rest of us are going to stay. Because we need to understand the importance of going the second mile as we help carry each other's burdens. I don't believe that I ever really watched a segment, a full segment, maybe a, a moment or two, of a program called American Idol. But I know enough to know that one of the judges, Simon Cowell, who used to be one of the talent judges, enjoyed tearing people down. That was what he was known for. He is exceptionally good at cutting and stinging remarks at those people who sang and it was, it was, it was this talent judge. He's, he made such remarks as this to these often very young and vulnerable contestants. He said to one, if you lived 2,000 years ago and sang like that, they would have stoned you. <laughs> now that's hurt. You know, that hurts. He said to another contestant, that was absolutely ghastly. I could honestly say if you won, it would be the end of the American music industry. <laughs> That's hard. Work. He said to another <laughs> contestant, that was dreadful. Is singing something you want to pursue? And the contestant thought for a second and said, I can take it or leave it. And with a sinister smile on his face, Simon responded, leave it. While most of us never face relentless critics like Simon, many of us have experienced the brokenness that comes from sin or just trying to bear burdens that come from life itself. Unfortunately, the church is often the last place that we find friends and we find comfort and that we find help in time of need. Actually, those sometimes who are closest to us are the people who end up whacking us. <laughs> it reminds me of the story of the wife that came home from the grocery store. She walks in the door and her husband is over in front of the stove. She sees a wire running from his head to his hand and he's in front of an electric frying pan. But he's, he's going like this and she thinks he's being electrocuted. She grabs a two by four and whacks him, breaks his arm in two places. He turns around and she realizes He's got his iPod in his pocket. It's his earphone, she sees. <laughs> We're quick to chasten. We're quick to judge. We're quick to jump to conclusions about brothers and sisters in Christ when really what we need to do is put our arms around them and say we love them and that we want to be there if, we, if there's anything that we can do to help. You see, we're so quick to swing and whack at one another rather than doing as we are instructed to do here in Galatians chapter 6 and that is we're to bear one another's burden. I'm sure you probably remember the TV commercial spent a number of years ago where the elderly lady has fallen down. And she says, help me! I've fallen and I can't get up. And I'm sure you remember that commercial. And that phrase actually became part of our vocabulary. Help me! I've fallen down. I can't get up. Well, listen, 
there are times in our spiritual life that we also fall to, that we fall down, and we help me, I can't get up, and we need somebody to come beside us and help us to get back up on our feet. Amen. We don't need criticism. We need, again, comfort and affirmation when we fall and we can't give. Now, as we look at Galatians chapter 6, let me back up just a little bit because, remember, our Bibles originally did not have chapters in them. So when we come to chapter 6, and it begins with brethren, we need to back up to chapter 5 just a little bit. And in chapter 5, notice what he says in verse 16. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh one of the things that we're constantly reminded is this flesh is so weak and and all of us are so weak but it's so essential for us to walk in the spirit to depend upon the spirit to, to guide and direct us then he jumps down to verse 22 and 23 and he talks about the fruit of the spirit and it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and all the good to speak this dinner is against us, there is no wall. And he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And then, look at verse 25 of chapter 5. He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If I'm living in the Spirit, if I'm walking in the Spirit, you know what's going to happen? things. First of all, I'm going to be sensitive to the Spirit of God when He touches my heart. I'm going to be in a tune to hear when God touches my heart. And secondly, when I'm walking in the Spirit, when I'm living in the Spirit, I'm going to be sensitive about my family around me. Are you hearing me? Amen. And so He's, he's saying, listen, if we walk in the if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. And how important Again, we're, we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means simply the Holy Spirit is in control of us rather than the flesh or the world is in control of us. And then in verse 26 of chapter 5, before we come to our scripture passage, he says, let us not become conceited. Uh, or, or uh, the word conceited, of course, is someone who's filled with themselves. They just think they're the best thing that ever happened. They're so conceited. And what is a conceited person? A conceited person is a what? Self-centered person. A conceited person is only thinking about themselves. That's all they look at. That's all they see. And so Paul is saying to the churches of Galatia, he says in verse 26, let us not become conceited this vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The word provoke means to challenge someone to a contest. We're so full of ourselves that we, oh, if, 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 you, if you want some week, you would be where you're at. Provoking. And then, he says in the last part of verse 26, he says, provoking one another. If, if we're not provoking one another, then these conceited people are jealous of one another. They're either conceited, so I'm better than you, or I'm so jealous of you, I wish I was where you are. And so he says, that's the prelude to verse 1 of chapter. Six. Now there are four truths here that I want us to see this morning in Galatians chapter 6. God has given to each of us four relational responsibilities in this passage. And we need to practice these four relational responsibilities. The first one is restore the broken. Verse 1. Brethren, if a 
man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now let me read the NIV verse, the New International Version. The New International Version reads verse 1 like this. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you are a spiritual restored in gentleness. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Now notice how Paul begins this verse, verse 1. First of all, he begins by calling out us who, who he's talking to, and that's brothers. Brothers refers to a family. We don't hear that term used as much in the church today as it was when I first started pastoring 50 years ago, we, in church, almost everybody was brother or sister. That's how you refer to each other. And, and, and so, but, but brother is, again, it's a family relationship. I often talk about that I am closer to my brothers and sisters in Christ than I am to my own biological brothers. I really am. I love my biological brothers. They're on, all on the East Coast. I see them. I don't see them very often. I talk to them every once in a while. But I'm, I just don't have that same connection to my biological brothers as I do my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so He's talking to the family. As he talks about, again, the need to help bear the burdens of one another. And so he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. And he uses the word if. Notice verse 1. Brethren, if. Now, He's helping us think about some hypothetical situation. That often, that's hypothetical often becomes very real. And what do we see here is he talks about brethren and this hypothetical, uh, hypothetical situation if he says, he gives us the situation. Here's the situation, verse 1. We have a broken believer. Look at it. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass. And again, the word man there is generic, so it's not just male. He's referring generically to mankind, man or female. And the situation is we have a broken believer. He says, if any man is overtaken. That word overtaken is often uh, used, uh, overtaken, or the word caught is used. And it's used to describe a bird or an animal that's been caught in a snare or in a trap. That animal bird didn't intend to get into the trap, but it was there and they were just that all of a sudden they became caught in this trap, this snare. And so the situation is, here is a broken believer. And he uses the word trespass in verse 1. Is overtaken in any trespass. And literally the word trespass is said. Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The word trespass is sin. And so, again, he, he's talking about the situation is a broken believer. I think a great example of a broken believer is Peter. Jesus had said to Peter, Peter, you better take heed to yourself. You think you're Mr. Big Shot. I've got news for you, Peter. You're going to deny 
me three times before the rooster crows. Three times. Da, 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 da. You've got me wrong, Lord. I am committed right to the core. You can tell me I would never, ever, ever do anything like that. And you know the story. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's taken to Thomas Judgment Hall. Jesus is being stood before the Praetorium. And there's Peter out warning himself. The little girl walks by. A maiden that says, you're one of his disciples. No, 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 I'm not a disciple. You've got to be mixed up with someone else. And we know when it came the third time, Peter began to curse this time. He began to curse with profanity. He got overtaken in a fault. Did he intend to do that? No. But in a moment of weakness of the flesh, Peter was overtaken. The rooster crowed. What did Peter do? Well, among other things, Peter repented. And certainly, Jesus did not distance himself from Peter. Jesus took Peter back in with love Amen. and Amen. compassion. So the situation is a broken believer. We see also who is to help. Who is to help this broken believer? Well, those who are spiritual. Verse 1. Brethren, if a man will take the trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. What is a spiritual believer? It's not some saint that's walking flying around with, with, with angel wings. The Bible refers to all of us as saints. A saint is a saved person. But a spiritual person is a person, again, who's walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. A spiritual person is one who we see the fruit of the Spirit here. It's not some super pious gas bag, I, my professor used to call it God, it's all these gas bags, you know, they're always spouting off. We're not talking about some spiritual gas bag. We're talking about just an ordinary person. Some of the most spiritual people I see are not people who are always talking. They're just living. And a spiritual believer is a believer who is walking in the Spirit. You see the fruit of the Spirit. You see love. You see joy. You see peace. You see kindness. You, you see gentleness in their life. Spiritual people are literally ordinary people relying on an extraordinary God. Put that in your pocket, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, the situation of broken believer, who's to help a spiritual believer? What is he to do? Here's the key. Look at verse 1. Brethren, if you be overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. What to do? We're to restore, not destroy. Restore. Now, the word restore means to make something right by bringing it back to its former condition. This word restore was a word that's used in Greek to speak of a broken bone. You've broken a bone. What do you do? You restore the bone. You mend it. Often put a cast upon it. But the, that broken bone is mended. This word restore was also used to speak about the fishermen who would mend broken nets. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, when Jesus is calling the disciples, John and James, Matthew 4, 21, Matthew, uh, or Matthew 4, 21, James and John are mending their nets, restoring when Jesus comes. He says, man, I want to make you a fishers of men, Father. So the word restore means to, to, to mend what is broken and to, 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 to bring, again, 
that which is torn apart back together again. Now listen to me. If a man or a woman is my brother or my sister, then I am his or her keeper. Brethren. How do we do that? How do we restore this person that, that again, is they, they're trespassed, they, they're fault, they, they've sinned, they, they've fallen into a trap? What do we, we restore them? But how do we restore them? Are you listening? Look at verse 1. I may just quit preaching after verse 1 and you get that because this is, this is so good. He said in verse 1, you were spiritual. Restore such a one what? In the spirit of what? Gentleness. If you had a broken arm, do you want the doctor jerking on it and everything else? No. You want it to be real careful. That hurts. You want someone gentle. Broken with a broken bone. And he's saying, how do we approach this brother who has fallen into sin? They've been snared. They've fallen into this trap. You're to spiritually restore. You're to bring them back. How do you do that? Well, you do it gently. Gently. Broken believers need spiritual believers who will come alongside them to mend them. The process must be done with gentleness, not harshness. Often we're so harsh. Oh, you know. And we need to be gentle. Keep your voice down, not like mine always up. <laughs> Keep your voice soft. That's gentle. Jewel says, gentle. Gentle. <laughs> to me, my voice is always about five octaves higher than an octave. <laughs> now I must confess that I don't always do very well with this. There are times when I want to restore someone, but I end up being more judgmental than gentle. And Paul struggled with this also. Paul said about himself in 1 Corinthians 4.21, he says, What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip? Or in love? Or with a gentle spirit? And if we do not allow ourselves to feel the pain of another person's burden, we're not going to be gentle. I've said this so many times before. You computer people, are you listening? And all of you know about computers. Our default setting is to get angry and judgmental with those who sin differently than we do. That's our default. You've got to go into settings and put the settings from default to what we need to do. Jesus is our model and our motivation. Jesus referred to himself as gentle and humble in heart. And then the last part of this first verse is this. Look at it. He says, Brethren, if any man is overtaken, and any trespass or sin, you are spiritual. Restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. But then he says this, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Every one of us at any moment are susceptible to fall into sin. That's right. Amen. Any one of us. And we must be careful. He said, you better consider yourself. Because, you know, we're worth, again, we're so judgmental. You know. and, and again, 
He says, rather than being just them, you better consider yourself. You see, it's true by the, by the grace of God. You know, I, I'm not there. It'd be easy for me to be there, but I'm not there. I'm not there. Consider yourself. And, and the truth of it is, we are all sinners. We all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 describes that we all struggle. And John said, if any man claims, says he is without sin, he deceives himself. The truth is not in him. We're all sinners. We have to work with that. Several years ago, an angry man rushed into a museum in Amsterdam and repeatedly slashed one of Rembrandt's most famous paintings. A short time later, in Rome, a man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral with a hammer and began to smash Michelangelo's masterpiece. What do you think those officials did? Well, Rembrandt's been damaged. Throw it in the trash. Michelangelo's been damaged. Just discard it. Well, absolutely not. What they did, they got the best people they could find to restore Rembrandt, to restore Michelangelo. Now, there's always scars, but restoration brings one back to the place of fellowship with our Heavenly Father. So, we are to restore the broken quickly, notice separately. He says, we have this relational responsibility to relieve the burden. Verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law. Now the word bear, there or carry means to remove or lift an overwhelming load. It's like a building is collapsed. A boulder has rolled down, and you're pinned under that building. You're pinned under that boulder. And I have a responsibility to help bear your burden, to help get you from under that load. We were watching the news the other night, and they read a story about a fellow that was working on his car. He had a golden jacket, and he'd gotten underneath the car. And as soon as he got in the car, that jack, that, that jack collapsed. And the man was pinned under there, his chest. Look at three. Two police officers came quickly, and they lifted the car up enough to get that man out. That's bearing one another's burdens. That's helping those who have a very special now, the burdens that stagger us, the burdens that weigh us down, that we think, how could I get through another day? The burdens that overwhelm us can be many different things. Sickness is one. Sudden tragedy. Sudden, sudden a loved one passes suddenly. You know, if you get, how can I get through this day and much less face tomorrow? That kind of a burden. Sometimes it's financial difficulty that just seems to overwhelm. It could be a broken dream. It could be a failed relationship. It could be a family problem when your children have broken your heart and torn you apart. be the death of the dearest one in your life. <coughs> but here's the point. I find it significant that Paul did not focus upon the burden. 
He didn't say, well, this one one pastor and this that. He didn't, he didn't talk about what the burden was. But he says, when you see your brother, when you see your sister that has this overwhelming burden on them, you have a responsibility to go and help one another. And he said in verse 2, when I do that, when you do that, what am I doing? I'm fulfilling the what? Royal law of Christ. Amen. What is the royal law of Christ? The royal law of Christ is John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For by this shall all men know you are my disciples because you love one another. That, beloved, is the royal law. Now, let me say something else here. You and I need to be very careful that we do not cause someone's burden. Jesus had no tolerance, zero. Jesus had no tolerance for those who piled people with problems and endless expectations. You know the harshest words that Jesus used were not toward the harlots and prostitutes and, and, uh, and, 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 and the tax collectors who were were fleecing people. He didn't have his harshest words against them. You know what he had his harshest words against? He had his harshest words against the religious leaders of the day. Amen. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 11 and verse 46, as he spoke about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and in Luke chapter 11 verse 46, Jesus says, you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. That's what Jesus said. Luke 11, verse 46. And I certainly don't ever want to be guilty of preaching in such a way that people leave the house of God more burdened than they did when they came in. Friend, do you pile on people who are down or are you a load lifter? He tells us, restore the broken, relieve the burden. Thirdly, he says in verse 3 and 4, repent of bragging. Look at it, verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Here we think we're so spiritual in ourselves now. Oh, I'm, I'm so much better than that person. Look, you know, I, I, I do all of these things. And I must confess, in my legalistic days of ministry, that's how we operate. We, 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 we operate in judging people by the external. I have few regrets of ministry. One regret I have is again that legalism that, that, that crept in uh, uh, following men rather than the scripture. Thank God those chains of bondage were broken and I began to follow God, follow the Spirit, follow the Word of God. Amen. I can care less what other preachers think. Amen. I really don't care. I really don't. Because again, I've been set free. And, and so he says, you repent of bragging, verse 3. It's so easy for us to look down our long noses of, of, of self-righteousness and say, well, they deserve it. We say something like, well, she's so weak. Or something like, he just can't handle the pressure. Or we say something like, oh, I saw it coming. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll say something. Or maybe they'll listen to me the next time. Or we'll say something. I don't want to get involved. Or 
You might say something like, I'm just glad it happened to them, not me. Oh, I know I've been through something like that. How quick we are to condemn and to look the other way. To those who are carrying burdens that are overwhelming them. He says, you're nothing special. And you better be careful about bragging. You better repent of it. He said in verse 4, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoiced himself alone without a time. We need to repent ourselves. Then let's go to number four, the last one. What are we to do? We're to respect your boundaries. Now you need to listen more carefully here, because look at verse five. Verse five says, For each one shall bear his own load. Now, some cynic and critic would say, well, there's a contradiction in the Bible. The Bible contradicts itself. In verse 2, it says we're to carry one another's load. And now in verse 5, it says every man's going to carry his own load. So that's a contradiction. You can't believe the Bible. You can't believe the Bible. He's telling us that in verse 5, there are personal responsibilities that only I can be responsible for. Let me give you just an example. The doctor says you have high blood pressure. So you're going to have to go on blood pressure medicine. Can I take your blood pressure medicine for you? No. I can take it. It's not going to help you. I can take it. I don't need it. You need it. I don't need it. I have a responsibility for my own health, so I've got, to, I've got to take that responsibility. We have personal responsibilities that nobody else can take care of. Life is responsibility. Yeah. And we need to be responsible. So in verse 5, He's referring to a small load, sometimes described as a soldier's backpack. It's something that an individual can carry. It's not some crushing weight. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I am a Bible student. There are two different words, Greek words, used. In verse 2, the word burden, the Greek word burden there, bear one another's burdens. The Greek word burden there is baros, which means a crushing weight, like being trapped under the rubble of an earthquake. The Greek word in verse 5, that each one shall bear his own load or burden. The Greek word there is fortion. Fortion is the Greek word, and it means that 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 we're to carry uh, uh, our own responsibility. It refers to anything that is carried that has no connotation of difficulty. It is often used in general obligations of life that a person is responsible to bear on their own. Now. What he says in verse 2 is that when a person has a load that's too heavy to carry, it is a barrels. We're to come alongside them to help them carry that load. But he says in verse 5, I can't carry your personal responsibility. If you can't keep your checkbook, what, I, I can't be there to keep your checkbook. That's your responsibility. If you need to be taught how to do math again, I, I, I can help it. But again, we have responsibilities that nobody else can do. We're to bear that which is too heavy for another human to handle alone, but we cannot carry someone else's responsibilities. We should help each other carry the big burdens of life, but we have personal responsibilities that we have to carry. The New Living Translation translates verse 5 this way. Listen. For we each, 
For we, let me start again. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Sometimes people need to step up to the plate, just be responsible for their own things. Now here's the question today. Will we partner with the Lord Jesus Christ to restore the broken? To relieve the burden? To repent of our bragging? And have a healthy respect for boundaries. We do not have to carry the world on our backs because Jesus has the world in his hands. Amen. That's right. Aren't you thankful that God is in the restoration business? Amen. I don't care how far a person has gone down the road of sin. God is there with his arms open as to come to me all the way to here later and I'll give you rest. God is in the restoration business. Brothers and sisters, we need to be in the restoration business. He doesn't give up on us. Even when we grieve him, and we do grieve him. He doesn't stop loving us when we can't lift our load and we're pressed down. He pursues us even when we are filled with arrogance and pride. And he breaks through when we operate without boundaries. May we hear in the family of BBC of Beauty, be committed to go the second mile as we have carried each other's burdens. Let me say to you that burdens are lifted at Calvary. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, and our hearts be open to the still small voice of God who speaks to us through the Spirit and lays upon our hearts others that we need to help maybe carry their burden. They may not be just a part of this church family, they may be neighbors, they may be friends, they may be absolutely that we need to help bear that burden. And that may be simply by making a phone call. That might be simply by writing a note. That might be simply by just stopping by to see them, just tell them we love them, we care about them, and they're on our hearts. It may be as simple as sitting with someone and holding their hand not with profound words of wisdom, but with tears of compassion and commitment that says, I love you because Jesus loves you, and I'm here for you. I'm here to help bear your burden. May we, like the same, speak Lord. I share with you. In Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Terry, as we sing that verse of invitation. Page 167, please. 167. Just as I am. 167. <laughs>
heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just before we conclude this morning, let me ask this question. I want you to think seriously about it. I wonder how many this morning would raise their hand and say, I want to be committed to my Lord and be <coughs> by helping one another. Does it mean you're going to go out and do something tomorrow? But it means, again, we're sensitive to the Spirit. And when we see a brother that's hurting and down and discouraged and, and, and need of some assistance of love or whatever it may be, I wonder this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking. How many would say, Pastor, I want to give it myself to help go that second mile to help one another? Let me see your hand if that's what you feel that way. I don't want you to do it unless you feel that way now. We're not, we're not counting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we're so grateful this morning for bringing us again together. We're together for such a time as this. And I pray that we might leave renewed in spirit and in energy to go on that second mile for one another. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 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 God bless you. Greet one another with this.